you know I generally don't ask for help. But today I need your help. Okay, I need your help to preach this sermon. So Mark, I know you just got married, but I need you up here. Come on. Yeah, I know you just got married and, you know, praise the Lord. And you just come on back up here. <laughs> That's my dog right there. Okay, so I need you to stand right over there and just face the... Uh, oh, okay, I can hug you. We can do that. <laughs> Where am I? So you're um, standing in front of the audience down on triplets. that side, and you're triplets. Here we go. Here we go. And uh, you're down on the uh, ground there, and you're facing the audience. See, he's very difficult. You know, I said, I, watch, how, watch how easy this is. I know, I know, I know. Dean, I, I need you to help me preach this sermon. Would you come and just stand right next to Mark and, uh, you know, just kind of watch how easy this is, Mark. Watch. And just turn around and face the audience, please, would you? See, see how easy that was, Mark? No, not even any words. Um, that tall gentleman right there is getting ready to sit down with the glasses, that handsome gentleman. I need you to help me preach this sermon. Come on. Come on, brother. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. I want you to stand right to um, Dean's right. All right? And then I need my man, John LaRocca. Yeah, that's right. You. Okay? I need you to come up here, brother. And I need you to stand next to Mark. Okay, I know that's a little difficult because he's going to be moving and all that, and, you know, and stuff like that. But that's who he is, man. You know, that's my dog too. Yeah, baby. I love you, man. I miss you, kid. Now, I am about to make and give a prophetic word. Everybody ready? You ready for this prophetic word? Someone here, Donna, is about to be heavily burdened. Donna, would you come? And I need you to stand right here. Just kind of stand, just, just kind of face them, okay? All right. <laughs> Would you hold this, please? Yeah, just hold it. Would you help her bear that burden? Would you help him bear that burden? Now, Mark, do what I know you're going to do, because this is the point of this. Would you help them bear that burden? Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. That's why I love them. John, would you help them bear the burden, please? Now, you gentlemen, you gentlemen can let go of the burden. How you doing, Donna? How's that burden? A little lighter, huh? Not as bad, right? Okay, so let me just take this out. How is it now? Lighter. Much lighter, right? Became lighter because we shared the burden with you. We didn't let you carry the burden by yourself. Ladies and gentlemen, we are called by God to bear one another's burdens. Let's get into the text. Give my crew a hand. Thank you. Thank you, man. Love you. See, I knew Mark would get it immediately because uh, I'm a little embarrassed by this, but we kind of think alike. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Our text today is coming out of Galatians, the sixth chapter, the first through the third verse. We're going to talk about our central theme here is bearing one another's burdens. Now, like I always do, I always like to study a text in light of its overall context. So I needed to look at why uh, Paul would write this book. What was the purpose that Paul wrote the book of Galatians? Because when we see that, we might understand a little better as to why he wrote what he wrote in the last chapter of the book, the first through the third verse. Now, Paul founded, as it were, the church at Galatia. It was a wonderful church. And then along came the Judaizers. Now, the Judaizers, Judaizers were individuals, a group of individuals who believed that in addition to being saved and justified by faith, not of works, they believe that you, 
Your salvation was dependent upon your adherence to the Mosaic law. So what they did was they added works to a work of grace. How many of you know that that's erroneous? See, you and I are saved by faith, faith saved by grace through faith, not of works, least any man should boast. But these particular Judaizers, they came and infected, and that's the right word, they infected the church at Galatia with this false narrative that they needed to, in addition to being saved by uh, uh, faith, they needed to adhere to the Mosaic law. And when you read the book of Galatians, you can feel Paul's anger. In fact, the church of Galatia became so infected that they actually started to believe that Paul, they started to question, I should say, Paul's apostleship. And if you read the book, you read the first two chapters, basically what Paul's doing is he is defending his apostleship. I am an apostle. And it wasn't because he was immature, uh, insecure. He needed to set the record straight. And by the time you get to the third chapter, he calls them fools. When was the last time you called somebody a fool? Not your uncle, not your brother, not your brother, sister, sister. When was the last time you said, you're a fool? All right, he called them foolish. Oh, foolish Galatians, who's tricked you? Who has fooled you? Who made you think that your salvation had anything to do with your works? You've been hoodwinked, tricked, run amok. If I was in a black church, y'all would get that. At any rate, um, know your audience, Larry. Know your audience. Now, <laughs> Malcolm X, you had to see the movie to understand. And when you get home tonight, you Google that scene. You've been run amok, tricked. Hoodwinked. All right. <laughs> but that's essentially what uh, 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 Paul was saying. You've been tricked. You've been duped. You've been fooled into thinking that your salvation has to do with your works. And then he gets to the fourth chapter after calling them foolish. He's speaking to the Judaizers now. And I can, you can almost see Paul's finger in the face of the Judaizers. He's saying, listen to me. There's a story back in our book about Sarah and Hagar. And both of them had children. Hagar's child was a child of the flesh. And although he was technic technically Abraham's descendant, because he was not the promised child, he is still a slave because he was born of a slave woman. But the son of Sarah and Abraham, Isaac, was the promised son. This son was born of a miracle. What miracle? Well, Sarah had a baby when she was 90. How many women you know can have babies when they're 90s? Do we have any 90-year-old women here? Yeah, my sister. Stand up and take a bow, take a bow, take a bow. Imagine for a moment if my dear sister here is having a baby. You see, if she did, we'd know it was a miracle. And that was the case with Sarah. God told Abram, your name's not going to be Abram anymore, it's going to be Abraham. Sarai, your wife's name, will not be Sarai any longer. It will be Sarah. She will have your child, and that child will be the promised child. So Paul raises this story to the church of Galatia to let them know that Christians, real Christians who have been saved by grace, saved by faith, they are like the children of Sarah. They are from the free line. But if you insist upon using the law and using rules and works to be saved, then you are still a slave. You see, legalism, legalism is bad for a number of reasons. One, it's not the real gospel. And two, it keeps you conscious of your sin and my sin. 
And by the way, you don't have to be brought up in a Pentecostal church to experience that. I was brought up in a Pentecostal church where we were taught how to be sin conscious. We were taught about sin and stay away from sin. If you really want to be saved, don't sin. We never heard that we were saved by grace. I never knew, I never was, I was never aware, as far as I'm concerned, until, until the time I was, I don't know, 13, 14 years old, never heard the message of grace. So you can understand Paul's angst, his anger. And so, it's no wonder that when he gets to the sixth chapter, he talks about something that the church tends to shy away from and we do a very, very poor job of dealing with. He says that in Galatians 6, verse 1, well, let's back up, let's back up, back up. Paul's angst. Kind of reminds me of what Jesus said in the book of Matthew, 11th chapter, 28 through 30. Remember the context now. Jesus is talking to Jewish people who are hearing his teaching, seeing his works, but every seventh day they're in the Sabbath, they're in the, uh, the uh, synagogue, and they're hearing about the law, and they're hearing the narrative and the rhetoric of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and they're trying to judge that against what Jesus is saying, and it's very tough for them to do. It's very tough for them to live a life for Jesus in this thing called the kingdom, when every Saturday they're hearing about the works of the law and all the things that they have to do and circumcision and all those things. And Jesus says this in Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 through 30. He says, come to me, all you that are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. Don't raise your hands. But how many of you have so many burdens today that they make you cry? How many of you are burdened down not only with whether or not you can pay the mortgage, whether or not someone is sick, how your children are doing, how your parents are doing, whether or not you'll be able to keep your job. Those are burdens. We get that. We get that. All of us have those burdens. But how many of you are sitting here today, you're burdened about how am I going to live this life for God? It's hard for me to live holy. It's hard for me to live right. It's such a struggle. If I sin today and the rapture happens, will I go to hell? What will happen? What does salvation really mean? And you're bogged down with the burden of righteousness, as it were. It's really not the burden of righteousness. It's actually the burden of sin. We call it being sin conscious. Jesus knew that burden, and that's why he told them, come to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, because my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Would you follow me to the text? Galatians 6, verses 1 through 3. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, do you see why I was talking about sin? You'll see why in a moment if you don't already. Brothers, if any one of you is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, however, lest you be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And verse 3, for if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Here's my proposition. We must bear each other's burdens. 
because of the reasons in Galatians 6, 1 through 3. You and I must bear each other's burdens because of the reasons, and there are three, in Galatians 6, 1 through 3. Let's get to them. First reason, we must restore people caught in sin. Second reason, we must fulfill the law of Christ. And third, we must demonstrate humility. Let's start at the top. We must restore people caught in sin. Do you know people fall in sin because they're weak? Usually because they're carrying burdens? One of the main reasons people become addicted is because they are trying to medicate and handle pain. Usually by numbing it. Let me read something to you that the men by and large can, can relate to. This is out of the book Rewire, Change Your Brain by Richard O'Connor, PhD. He says this, many people, especially men, turn to alcohol or other drugs to treat their anxiety. There are many older alcoholics who never realized they had anxiety. Check this out. They started drinking so young as a way of coping when stressful situ with st stressful situations, but in total denial about their stress that they never experience anxious symptoms, but take away their alcohol and they fall apart. You and I have in the center of our brain something called the limbic system. Essentially, the limbic system with all of its components is essentially a memory bank. How many of you remember this song? I've got sunshine on a cloudy day. Mm -hmm. When it's cold outside, I've got the month of May. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess you say what? can make me feel this way. It's my girl, my girl, talking about my girl. You see, that song brings back incredible memories to me, although I was only knee high to a duck when it came out. But I remember being down in my basement and borrowing my sister's records. Now, young folk don't know nothing about records, okay? But we used to have 45s and... So, ooh, that's really going back. What's the other one? 33, right? 33, that's right. Wow, 78. <laughs> 78 RPM, revolutions per minute, right? And I would go down to my basement and I'd steal, borrow my sister's, my sister's records, and I'd turn on those songs. Temptations are by far the finest, my favorite group of all time. I remember not only taking my sister's records and playing them, but I also remember how I felt when I was playing the music. I also remember my thoughts. Here's the interesting thing, folks. I'm 50 years old now, and I still remember what I felt when I think about that song. That's because of the limbic system. Oh, but the limbic system works against us as well. Not only does it remind us and, re and record the positive things, the lovely things, but the not so lovely as well. If you were raped at the age of 14, you remember that. And you remember how you felt when it happened. Just like it happened yesterday. If you were three years old and you remember your mother ripping you away from her breast and not allowing you to, to uh, 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 suck on the breast any longer because perhaps it hurt her. You remember that. Those feelings and emotions have been recorded. If you're experiencing and dealing with anger today, you are dealing with anger because anger is your 
It's your defense mechanism against people or things that will potentially hurt you. You may not be aware of it, but that's what it is. It's your limbic system working. You know why people sin? People sin because their limbic systems are working very, very well. And they've not learned how to apply truth to those memories and change those bad memories or sanctify those memories, I should say. I'll tell you something else about the limbic system. It stores patterns of learned behavior and our emotional reactions to them. It shifts, listen to this one, it shifts the attention and focus and controls the pleasure drives. You got a bad memory? Something you want to numb? It will control your pleasure drive. You might be more apt to go find something to drink, more apt to go have sex with somebody outside of your relationship. You might be more apt to do those things if you don't recognize that your limbic system is actually in full swing. The limbic system has been implicated in OCD and in addiction, but we just talked about that. Why is that germane? Because if we're going to restore people that have been caught in sin, you and I have to be spiritual enough to understand why they went there in the first place. My wife and I, I guess it was about 10, 15 years ago, <clears throat> we were in a very tough place in our marriage, and, um, which I'm sure none of you can imagine being married to me, right? That wouldn't be, you know. At any rate, we were in a very, very... Um, rough place in our marriage and we were wise enough, thank the Lord, to go get counseling. And um, during that time, one of our friends was visiting the house from California. And uh, at that time, we had this really, really rickety, Judy, we had this rickety um, June. I said Judy, but you're June. I got it right. I got it right. After I got it wrong. Um, June, we had this rickety air conditioner that basically cooled the living room and the dining room, okay? And we have a very small house, so it was doing the job, but it made a lot of noise. Somebody say a lot of noise. It made a lot of noise. The kind of noise that wives don't, they don't appreciate. Cheap guys like me, it's like it works, keep, it, keep using it. My wife came to me one day, and she said, listen, we need to change this air conditioner. And I was like, nah, you know, I don't want to go and spend three, $400 on an AC. Can we just keep this? My wife being who she is, she didn't like it, but she said, well, okay, well, whatever. But then my friend came to visit. She came into the living room, sat down. The minute she sat, within two minutes, she said, boy, it's hot in here. I said, you know, you're right. Marissa, let's go to, the air, let's go to Home Depot and go buy an air conditioner. <laughs> right, right. Whoever just said, right. You got to know that came up in counseling, right? You got to know that that came up in counseling. So we're, we're with the counselor, and Marissa brings it up, and I'm like, I was, I, Larry Felder, was speechless. I couldn't say a word. It was, I, I was like, hamna, hamna, ha, 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 ha. You ever seen, um, what's it, uh, 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 The Honeymooners, Ralph Crandon? Hamna, 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 hamna. I didn't even say hamna, hamna, hamna. I was just because I didn't understand what was going on. I don't know, maybe Marissa thinks that I, had, that I was having uh, 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 feelings or some, some, somehow romantically tempted toward this woman, which I didn't. I, what, I didn't have an answer, didn't have a clue. But my wise counselor said, Larry, what did this friend of yours look like? Well, she was a stocky, dark-skinned woman. He said, what'd your mother look like? Stocky, dark-skinned woman? Tell me about the tone of your friend's voice. Oh, very strong, she's a, she's a, she's a singer, she's a Broadway singer. So she has this really strong, powerful voice. Um, what was your mother's voice like? Hamana, 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 hamana. He said, you see, Larry, You've never been healed or delivered 
from the harsh treatment of your childhood where you learned that in order to be safe in your home, you had to satisfy mommy. Holy. It was like the light bulbs turned on. Do I still deal with that today? Yes, but I don't fall to it anymore. Because I'm aware of what's going on. The limbic system was in full swing, but I did not have understanding. But now since I have understanding, and I'm around strong, you know, out front black women that are older, mother figures, I don't, I don't, I don't try to kowtow and try to please them anymore because I'm aware of what goes on inside of me. Our job, our job as Christians is to bring back to restoration or to restore those caught in sin. We can't do it. We cannot do it. There's no way we can get to it without understanding where they come from. I'm going to share this final story to you and go to my next point. I had a good friend who was caught in some indiscretion. He was a pastor of a church. If I told you what the indiscretion was, you'd say, Larry, that doesn't qualify as an indiscretion. But anyway, his church said it did, and he was fired. He and his wife, they sought counsel. For a year and a half, they worked on their relationship. They worked on whatever issues um, he was dealing with. A year and a half later, counselors came back to the organization and said, look, this guy is, he's fixed. He's right. He can be reinstated. The church wouldn't reinstate him. You know why? Because he had sinned. And they had forgotten that their job was to restore, not just correct. When we bear one another's burdens, the first thing we have to do is look to restore. Our second point, we fulfill the law of Christ. Would you please look at me, look with me to uh, John, the Gospel of John, the 13th chapter, and the 34th and 35th verse. Um, a new commandment, Jesus is speaking, I give to you that you love one another just as I have loved you. And you also are to love one another. Verse 35, by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. First John, the epistle, fourth chapter, the 21st verse, John is hearkening back to what Jesus said when he was walking the earth. He says, and this commandment we have from him, him being Jesus, whoever loves God must also love his brother. And just so you know, that this law of Christ, Paul is very consistent. When he talks about this law of Christ, he had already mentioned that in the fifth chapter of, of the book of Galatians, the 14th verse. It says, for the whole law is filled in one word, Mr. Judaizer, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, member of the Galatians church. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If you want to live by the law, love your neighbor as yourself. In doing so, you have fulfilled the love of Christ, the first law of Christ. Let me talk to some of you couples out here for a moment. I want to make this concrete. And I'm really talking to the young people who aren't married yet, but don't tell them this. So I'm, I'm talking to you guys, okay? But I ain't talking to the, to the, I'm really talking to them, okay? Our young people who are in high school and junior high school and think they in love. Let me give you a working definition of love. And let me do a Charles Stanley here. You listening? Say amen. amen. Good. Love always looks out for you at the expense of himself. Love always gives and looks out for you at the expense of self. Larry, that sounds good, but can you prove that biblically? Yes. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son 
The whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. The love of God was manifested in that he gave us his only son. It was at his expense that he expressed love. Lust is just the opposite, folks. Lust looks out for me at the expense of you. You want to know one of the, whether them saggy pants boys really loves you? <laughs> I ain't going to do it. Not going to do it. Because y'all don't want to see that. And my wife said amen. Yeah. <clears throat> We're safe. Ain't going to go there. But those saggy pants cats or those females that got the great cuts walk like this, you know. Let me tell you whether you know they love you or lust you. If what they're asking for you is benefiting them and not you, they're lusting you. If what they're asking from you benefits you and does not benefit them, they love you. So they'll be willing to not have sex with you even though they want to They will stop at not going to do that because I love you. Now, I realize that I'm talking in ideals here. Amen? Y'all got that, right? Good, good, good. The point is no one's perfect. But if a man loves you, he will do for you, young lady, at the expense of himself. If a woman loves you, if a girl loves you, Carlos, she will do for you at the expense of herself. If she lusts you, it's all about her. If he lusts you, it's all about him. I sense that was a word for somebody. That's why I threw it in. Now, if we are to bear one another's burdens, then we fulfill the law of Christ by loving others just as Christ loved us. In other words, we prefer them over ourselves. Finally, we demonstrate our humility. Psalm 104 verse 3 says it this way, for he knows our frame, he remembers that we are just dust. You know, when you're in the business of restoring someone who has sinned, someone who has fallen, the Bible says one of the ways that you can be assured that you can do it effectively is A, you're walking in the spirit. You're walking by the power of the spirit. And two, that you consider yourself that you could be just as vulnerable. How do we bear one another's burdens? First, we restore those that are caught in sin. Second, we fulfill the law of Christ. And three, we demonstrate humility. Let's close it up. Let's apply this. Good. Let me give you various relational contexts that you can think about this. Husbands and wives. How do husbands bear the infirmities or bear the weaknesses or the, the burdens of their wives? How do wives bear the, bear the weaknesses of their husbands? I'm getting really good at this. If you think I'm bragging, I am. I'm learning to pay attention and listen to my wife, even though the World Series is on. <laughs> I'm learning to listen to her, even though I'm involved in studying so I can complete my degree. And she walks in from work and she wants to download. I'm learning to turn away from the computer, sit there and listen to her. In doing so, I believe I am bearing her burdens. Because when you come home from work, how many of you know you gotta download? Especially women, you gotta download. You gotta talk about it. Men too as well. She says, thank you. We do as well. But I picked up a secret the other day, Lee, because I was doing really, really well. I got a secret, though. When the game's on, it's not enough to put it on pause. I was doing that. She'd come in, pause, hey, babe, what's up? And we're listening. 
And I'm listening, and I'm listening. I'm definitely connected. I'm listening. And then she'll say something like this on her way out. She said this the other day. That's why I know, okay, I'm not getting this quite right. She says, okay, you can unpause it now. Ah. That was good. And thank you for that. That's what she said. And she was kind of reading my mind because apparently, and you women are very, very wise. You guys can like see through us somehow or another. Somehow she saw, yeah, he listening, but his mind is still on that game. So you know what I'm going to do now, Lee? I'm going to shut it off. Click. Why? Because in doing so, maybe I am, maybe I'm helping to uh, carry her burdens. There are ways that women can carry the burdens of men. I'll let you women figure that out. <laughs> men and women. Men and women in general. You and I live in America, but it's not only here in America. Women are marginalized here. We're trying to do a lot better, but they're marginalized here. Women are always on the set. They're always, we pay them less. Doing the same job. We'll pay the woman less than we pay the man. Why? Why? Is the man more important than she is? How do we bear the burdens of our sisters, brothers? Maybe what we do is we start getting involved with changing laws and making it illegal to do that. Maybe we start preferring our women, women in general, I should say, over men, or at least equalizing it. What about brothers and sisters? You know, whenever I think about this, and I'm in, in a church, I think about, um, I think about uh, Carlito and, uh, and Ketty. I think about brothers and sisters. And I think about, you know, that dynamic. Because I had a sister. I, I have two sisters. Now, they're older than me, so there was only but so much I can do to get their attention. Now, I was a snot-nosed kid. You know, maybe not snot-nosed, but I was a kid. And... Um, you know, I'd pick at them and stuff like that. But how do we bear, how does a brother bear the infirmities or bear the weaknesses and burdens of his sister? How does his sister bear his burdens? Think about that as we try to apply this. What about employee to employer? How can I make my boss's job easier? Take some, mm, somebody said, mm. yeah, we don't think about these things. But especially if you're dealing with a Christian environment, and the context here is Christianity, okay? But you can, you can, as a Christian, and you're working at a secular job, perhaps you can take this principle to your job. What about parishioner and pastors? How do I, as a pastor, Pastor Ed and Pastor Ernie and Pastor Lee and others, how do we... Bear your burdens. How might you bear ours? What about students and teachers? I know I never thought about you know, bearing the burden of a professor, but maybe I can. Maybe I need to think differently about that. How about this one? How about the younger and the older? Bridging that gap between the young and the older, and the older and the young. How do we older folks bear the burdens of our young brothers and sisters? How do our young brothers and sisters bear the burdens of the older? One of the ways that we try to do it in worship is um, all of our songs maybe don't have to be contemporary. Maybe some of the songs are hymns and, and relate more to an older crowd. And at the same time, the older crowd does not stand banging their fists on the desk or the chairs or the pews and saying, you must sing hymns. Maybe they can bear the infirmities of the younger by getting with some of this young stuff. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, maybe they can move their hands and swivel their hips. You know, maybe... We do that by bearing it, and I, I know it's funny, but I'm so serious. We don't do it. That's why we have so much stuff going on in the church, because we don't bear one another's burdens. This is going to get a little harder. 
How about Japanese Christians and Korean Christians? You do know that Korea was a colony of Japan. I believe it was during the 40s, the World War II. You don't think that the limbic system in the mind of the Korean Christian has forgotten that? You don't think that the limbic system in the mind of the Japanese brother or sister or pastor, that's not still in his mind? But how do you overcome it? By receiving truth. Where the truth of God's word or truth, period, usurps this worldly dominated philosophy. The next one's a tough one, but it exists. Puerto Ricans and Dominicans. Oh, you do know that there's a natural animosity between Dominicans and Puerto Ricans. And both of them have their positions. Yet we have an example right here in this church. We have an example right here in this church how someone or two individuals as well as their families are more committed to the word of God than the political system of this world. Your pastor Ernie is Puerto Rican. His wife Pilar is Dominican. And they married. They love each other. And they got a baby. <laughs> nevertheless, <laughs> nevertheless, the great divide still exists. What about blacks and whites? Or well, Haitians and Jamaicans was the first one. Well, let's go to the blacks and whites. Now, I am neither a Republican or a Democrat, so I can say this. I want to give you something to think about. Why would your slogan be, make America great again, in a country where African Americans and indigenous people live? Because they will ask the normal question, when was America ever great? And whenever your answer is, the following question is, when was it great for African Americans and indigenous people? You don't think that the limbic system in me as an African American exists when I came to this church? You better know it does. Just like your limbic system works too. Now some of us would like to just deny this stuff. No, it don't, don't exist, you know, the ground is level at the cross and all that. And it doesn't, really? Really? It doesn't exist? How do you know it doesn't exist? Have you been tested? Now what I love about our church is that while I was here, you have a white senior pastor, you got a Puerto Rican associate pastor, and you got a black man as the worship pastor. We got three pastors here of all different, and that, that's what, that's the kingdom. That's the kingdom. When you say make America great again as a Christian and you fly that flag, are you thinking about me? Or are you just standing on a political position because you think that if we change the laws, that will make people holy. As a black man, do I continue to fly my rage and my anger at being an American and having to deal with all the things like that? And every white person I ever met is a racist and I'm not forgiven? My job is to forgive. My job is to believe that the ground at the cross is level. And that our spiritual heritage usurps our natural heritage. And before you and I were white, black, green, or whatever, we were created in the image of God. 
And therefore, there is no reason, excuse me, there is no escape, there is no justification for thinking that any man, no matter what color, what creed, what age, whatever, is inferior to anybody else, not according to the scriptures. Amen? amen. Somebody say amen. amen. I often say that our church is somewhat indicative of what heaven's going to look like. We got Haitian folks here. We got, hey, man. <laughs> we got Puerto Rican folks up in this piece. We got Dominican folks up in this piece. We got Irish people up in this piece. We got Italian people up in this piece. We got Polish individuals up in this piece. Did I miss? What did I miss? We got Korean folks up in this piece. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Say again. We got Colombians up in this piece. Marain. Trinidad. Oh, Lord Jesus. We got the Trinidadian there. That's right. Trinity the born. Trinity the born. See, Jamaicans would they say, never say Trinity the born. Or they wouldn't. Trinities would say up the road, right? Up the road. Jamaicans would say, go down the road, man. Why, go on, go on, go on, my go on down the road there. The Trinity would say, up the road, down the road. They know I'm a Yankee, that's why they're laughing. Not a Yankee fan, let's not get this thing twisted, okay? All right. As you think about this message this week, would you think about bearing the burdens in these contexts? Black, white, Haitian, Jamaican, Korean, Japanese, employee, boss, man, women, husband, wife. Would you please look at this video? Can you give us some, um, some uh, volume, please? จะไม่ได้อะไรเลยไม่ได้รวยขึ้นไม่ได้ออกทีวีไม่มีใครรู้จักไม่ได้มีชื่อเสียงที่มากขึ้นเพื่อนเทคเดอร์พอร์ตไม่สามารถเอาไปทำได้เพราะสิ่งที่เขาได้คือได้แค่ความรู้สึกได้เห็นความสุขได้เข้าใจ
ที่สวยงามกว่าเดิมในชีวิตคุณอะไรคือสิ่งที่คุณต้องการมากที่สุดไทยประกันชีวิตเชื่อในความดี Our Father and our God we are asking you to sensitize us make it a matter of our priority help us make this a matter of our priority to carry each other's burdens. That specifically, if we find someone overtaken in a fault or a sin, that we would look to restore them by being led by your spirit, who understands all things, understands the makeup of every human being. Let us look past what we naturally see so that we might accomplish your will and that they might be restored. In doing so, Lord, we realize that we will be fulfilling what you called us to fulfill, and that is the principle of love. And Lord, may we remain humble in doing so, considering ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.